Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Grace Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here. Let's all stand together as we sing His Robes for Mine, O Wonderful Exchange. such theologically rich words in that hymn. Um, they really speak to my heart. So thank you, Pastor Halleck, for choosing that song and for you guys singing that tonight. Um, I do have a prayer request, including all those prayer requests we mentioned this morning. Um, Bob Campbell was just not doing real well since his heart attack in June, and Judy asked prayer for uh, Bob uh, tonight, and so we said we would definitely tell the church about that. Be in prayer for him, if you would, please. And uh, all the other folks we mentioned this morning, we talked about Rhea Graham. Uh, we did mention Dr. Ice. He was here this morning. I did not get to talk to him, but he was here. And then um, uh, we talked about Gail Walenta starting radiation tomorrow. And um, then for Diana Schumann, the little, or Dinah, I, I think it's Dinah, Matt, and, Matt Schumann's uh, daughter, Peggy and Larry Schumann's granddaughter, five years old, who's been battling pneumonia. So you pray for her as well. Those are requests that we had this morning. All right, let's go Lord in prayer and ask his blessing upon our time together. Father, we thank you for each one that's here. We thank you, Lord, for the rain. And uh, Lord, we needed the rain. You know exactly when to send the rain. And uh, Father, we thank you that um, these are here tonight. We thank you for those that are live streaming as well. And Lord, I pray that each one will receive a blessing from tuning in, from being here, from singing together, from fellowshipping, uh, listening to your word preached, letting the Holy Spirit of God work and convict us in our lives. So Lord, I pray that you might be with each one here now. And Lord, also be with uh, Bob Campbell. We pray for him tonight, especially. Uh, Lord, that you would strengthen him, that you would help him to get over this heart attack that he has had, and uh, Lord, that he might um, be up and around. Lord, be with Judy as she tends to him. Give him both strength, I pray. And so, Father, uh, we lift uh, him up to you. And thank you, Lord, now for each one. We thank you, Lord, for this church. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would continue to use us in a mighty way in this community and around the world. Now, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If any of you still have your handout from the uh, July 4th Sunday when we sang In God We Trust in God Alone, go ahead and take that out. We're going to sing that this evening. And cleanse our hands in God. 
Hope you've been uh, enjoying learning that song, all right? Um, I think that's a Patch the Pirate song written by Adam Morgan, his son-in-law, right? And uh, so you can see that on YouTube and other places if you want to hear it sung. Uh, they have a lot of renditions of it. There's a good quartet rendition of that, I believe, with some of those guys uh, singing that song. It's very, very good, but that's a great song. And uh, so it'll ring in your head. I, I found myself whistling it this whole month just at random times in the office, and the girls get probably perturbed at me. Um, no, no whistling aloud, uh, but it, it is a song that stays in your head. All right, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, the teens do leave for camp and the juniors tomorrow. They will be leaving from in front of the gymnasium, as Pastor Brent announced this morning. So in front of the gymnasium uh, tomorrow uh, at those times listed in the bulletin there. If you have any questions, contact Pastor Brent. Caleb's Ken has a mystery guest this coming Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. I have no idea who it is, okay? They do their own thing. I just show up, all right? Uh, so mystery guest, 10 o'clock, and uh, hopefully some mystery food as well there on Tuesday. But uh, Super Summer Tuesday is not, a, is not a mystery. We have Chaplain uh, Matt Barnes, who we support down at the Indiana State House. Uh, it was a pleasure to get to know him last summer in Super Summer Tuesday. And now this summer, we look forward to hearing what God has been doing for this last year. Um, so come and hear Chaplain Matt Barnes. He's doing tremendous work down there. I've seen him at work down there. I've been with him when he's uh, mingling with the uh, representatives, with the senators. Um, he is well-known. He is well-respected. And he has a great um, presence there. They trust him. They trust him. And so uh, you come on Tuesday at 7 o'clock. There's a ladies' discipleship study that every week I mention is open to anybody as far as the ladies are concerned. Um, ladies' discipleship, there's no men's discipleship study on Wednesday, but there will be a ladies' one. And then there's, a, there's always a ladies' Bible study at 1 o'clock on Thursday. That's open to anybody as well. Uh, we have the Never Alone Widows' Luncheon and the Men's Monthly Luncheon all open to anybody as well. Uh, you can read about that in the bulletin. RU Recovery meets every Friday at 7. Um, they posted some pictures on Facebook this past Friday. Good, good crowd was there. And uh, so you continue to pray for them. Help, and help them out if you can um, by volunteering as well. <clears throat> uh, Pastor Brent did go out with Pastor Beeson and set up the booth at the Delaware County Fair. They said it's pretty much flooded out there, but it's supposed to be a good week. All right, it's supposed to be one of those hot weeks um, as well. No rain in sight after this is over, I think. All right, that'll take a while to go, all go down. Um, but... Um, they said some of those cars out there that were parked, uh, setting up booths alongside them, the water was above their wheels uh, out in the parking lot already. So um, I don't know. Um, I don't think it'll be like that the rest of the week. But help us if you can out there as well. Next Sunday night after church is an annual business meeting. Pray along those lines if you would as well. Um, we baptized this morning. Um, maybe your children have been asking about baptism. Maybe you need to follow the Lord and believers baptism if you've been saved but never scripturally baptized. Uh, why don't you come forward? The deacons will hear your testimony of salvation and uh, then we will um, plan a time to baptize. Otherwise, we do have a baptism class normally every last Sunday of the month and that is listed there on Sunday, July 30th in the conference room. Uh, we also have a pie and praise for that fifth Sunday as well. Uh, our theme is casseroles and crock pots. And so we're asking you ladies, and I know some of you like, guys like to cook as well, uh, whatever you can cook in a crock pot and a casserole dish, bring it with you on that Sunday. I'm giving you a fair warning on that. We're going to be using these kind of themes throughout the year on our fifth Sunday pie and praise. We'll have soups and chilies. We'll have maybe just desserts. Maybe we'll have other things. Um, but this is the one we've chosen for this next time, casseroles and crock pots. Um, you can see the rest of the Super Summer Tuesday is coming up here. You can see where Heritage Hall begins on a Monday, uh, August 15th here. And then elective classes begin on August 17th after our Super Summer Tuesday series is over. So grab a bulletin, stay apprised of all the things that are going on here at Grace Baptist Church and the school, and um, make sure you don't miss anything at all. All right. I think that will be all the announcements. Let's have our ushers come at this time to receive the evening offering. We do have a few leaks. If you've been in the men's bathroom, men, 
You can see a leak in there. There's some leaks in the office. There's some leaks upstairs here, I think, as well. So we are calling Sheriff Goslin in the morning and uh, making sure we get those fixed, all right? Uh, this, this is uh, quite the deluge here today, so um, we'll, we'll see what happens. How many of you had to wade through some water just coming to church today? I mean, all right. I mean, we got it all uh, in one sitting, folks. I mean, this is it. Uh, get it while you can. So let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our offering. Father, thank you for your provision in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for, for a building, for a roof, for comfort, and uh, Lord, for the ability to pay for these things. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the giving of your people this past year, surpassing all other years in total giving. And uh, so, Father, thank you for the generosity of your people. And Lord, may we continue to be faithful to you till you come for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, ladies, for that offering in song. We are more than conquerors. That was Laura and Chelsea Lawrence. Mother-daughter duet. Appreciate that this evening. Let's take our hymnal once again and take turn to hymn number 170. 170. Let's all stand as we sing, I know of a name, a beautiful name. I know. Beautiful 
we sing on that last stanza, we'll dismiss the four to eight-year-olds to their class. I love that blessed name, that wonderful name, made higher than all in heaven. T'was whispered, I know, in my heart long ago, to Jesus my life I've given. That beautiful name, that beautiful name, from sin. Thank you. You may be seated. This time we'll have a special in song by Brother Kent Geringer.
Thank you, Brother Kent. It's a beautiful rendition of that. Take your Bibles once again, please, tonight and turn to Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, we will finish off what I started here this morning. Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> Talk about um, stability in the world, all right? And uh, we know that the world in which we live in is less stable than it ever has been. I think that um, the world has always been an unstable place. But I think Jesus predicted this. I think the Bible predicts this, that um, in the end times, things are going to get more and more unstable. You think about the morality that is unstable out there in the world today, where people don't even know uh, the difference between a man and a woman. They won't, they won't make a distinction between a man and a woman. I heard that just this past week that the Church of England decided that there is uh, no definition for that of a woman. The Church of England, okay? Um, I guess there goes the Anglican Church, all right? Uh, man, I was holding on, holding out for hope on that one. Uh, not really. Uh, but it, it, it's just, it's amazing to see that you can't even, you can't even get stable out of people concerning the genders, okay? Uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing. They're, this is, they call that fluid, uh, gender fluidity, okay? Whatever that may mean, all right? Gender fluidity. Uh, that's very unstable, okay? Um, you can't say what's what anymore, all right? We mentioned politics this morning. We mentioned education. We mentioned the financial markets. We mentioned even job markets and even marriage as a whole, on the whole. Uh, all these things can be unstable, promises in general that people make to you uh, that keeps your life unstable in so many different ways. Uh, you can't count on anybody. But listen, folks, I'm here to tell you tonight that you can still count on one thing and one thing only, and that's Jesus Christ and his word, all right? Jesus Christ and his word. I never have to worry about what's going on around me. I never have to worry about the storms of life. And I mentioned that song uh, that is taken directly from Hebrews chapter 6 here uh, concerning that hope is the anchor of the soul, all right? We have an anchor that keeps the soul. Steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Hey, folks, if, we don't, if we're not living in stormy times and in times of this... Uh, fluidity in all kinds of areas, then I don't know what we're living in. Okay. But Jesus Christ brings stability, and you can have the ability to be stable in your life. I'm going to read once again in Hebrews chapter 6, and I will begin reading in verse 9. Verses 1 through 8 are all about the people that uh, have heard uh, of uh, Christ, and they have been enlightened, and they have tasted of the good gift, and uh, they have rejected that eventually here. But he says in verse 9, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. The writer of Hebrews talking to these Christians at this church, all right? And he says, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. We know it's bad. We know what we just said. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Hey, he says, you're doing the work. You're, you're staying by the stuff. And he says, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope. And we talked about this this morning, that we can have that a hope in the promises of God. The full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers. That word literally means imitators. Followers of them who through faith and patience, the persuasion and patience that we talked about this morning, inherit the promises. And the writer of Hebrews goes on to talk about Abraham. Abraham, who God promised that he would be the um, father of a great nation, that he would have a child, that that child would be uh, the sole heir, uh, of, of, uh, the sole progenitor of everybody that would come after him. All right. And of course, Abraham believed God, the Bible says. He had moments of weakness. Have you ever had a moment of weakness when you believed God? Uh, you believe God overall, I know, but the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That moment when God knew in Abraham's heart that he did believe him, he placed his faith in God's word. That's how we're saved even today. It's always been how people have been saved. Old Testament, New Testament, faith in God's word. The word of God came to Abraham and said, you're going to have a child. Abraham believed him. Did Abraham... Falter some? Yeah. 
Okay. Did he have moments of weakness? Yes. We talked about that this morning. We know the account. But Abraham ultimately believed God, and he saw, the Bible says, he patiently endured, in verse 15, he obtained the promise. He obtained the promise. It was his that he, that he had waited for, and he finally attained it. Okay. Now we're going to move on here to verse 18, where the Bible says that by two immutable things, the unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. The second thing that I see here is uh, as far as our hope in God and where it mentions hope three different times in this passage is first of all the promises of God and secondly here the protection of God. The protection of God. I say the protection of God because the Bible says that we fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. We have fled for refuge. You know, this world is locked in despair. It's locked in despair. Uh, they know it. Okay. They understand it. They have a feeling of, a, of foreboding that is going on in the world today. But hope is just the opposite of that. If I wanted to use a bigger, more descriptive word, I would say that hope is the antithesis of despair. You can look it up. All right. It's the opposite. It's, it's a diametrically opposed opposite of despair. Hope is the exact opposite. Okay. Hope is the antithesis of despair. But I won't use that word. <clears throat> I'll just say that it's the opposite. This world has no hope. Okay? But God's protection from that despair, God's protection from the sin and the wickedness is the refuge to which we flee. The refuge for safety. Okay? Um, you know, from time to time when it does rain like this, we have bicyclists and motorcyclists and people like that stop underneath our awnings uh, just to get out of the rain and things. We've talked to them before um, and, and stuff. You know, it's a little place where you can just pull over. You've also maybe stopped underneath a, an overpass when it's rained really hard uh, on the interstate or something like that, try to get out of the rain, all right? Um, you know, we have these places that we can run to, all right? When the tornado sirens uh, go, you go to the basement, all right? Uh, that's where we, we went in... Uh, in um, <clears throat> that was May of 1995 when the tornado took mom and dad's house. We went to the basement. If we wouldn't have gone to the basement, uh, we probably would have died. Okay, uh, took most of the house away. Um, <clears throat> that was that was a scary time. But we had a place to run to. All right, where are you going to run to in this world to get away from the sin, to get away from the wickedness? The Bible says here in verse 18, by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. We lay hold upon that hope. By God's protection from that despair. If you're experiencing despair for whatever reason today, okay, um, and it doesn't even have to be about the world events. You could care less about the world events. You could care less about how things are falling apart and the economy's tanking and the gas prices are soaring and everything's going wrong. Uh, you, could, you could care less about that. I get it. You have deeper problems, maybe some relationship problems, family issues. Maybe you have health problems, financial problems. Maybe there's a wayward child. Maybe there's something else going on in your life, and, and you are in despair. Despair. Christians don't have to live in despair, okay? They don't. There's some things that you've been through before where maybe... You looked at it and you knew it was coming. You didn't know how you were going to make it through that. You didn't know how you are going to get through that. But you know what? I hope you found that Jesus is the refuge from these things. He's a refuge from despair. The refuge from despair. The that one day we will be totally saved. That we'll have a new body that cannot sin. That we will be totally sanctified. Totally righteous. God's work of salvation will one day be complete. And if that doesn't give us some sense of stability, I think it should give us a sense of stability and give us an anchor for our lives when the storms come, then nothing can. Nothing can. I was talking to one of my kids the other day, and um, he was talking my ear off. It feels like I'm bragging. It feels like I'm bragging. Now our home is not perfect, okay? It's not perfect. 
And um, he mentioned, uh, because my kids know that, um, you know, I felt the call to the ministry in seventh grade, probably a year before that in sixth grade, God was working in my heart, okay? But in seventh grade, I knew that God had called me to preach, okay? I knew that God had called me to the ministry. He said, well, that gives a kid so much stability. And I said, yeah, it did. I knew what I was doing. I knew where I was headed. I knew what I had to do in order to get there. And it brought great stability to my life. It sure did, okay? I always wanted that for the young people that I preached to while being a youth pastor. I want that uh, for my kids. I want that for this church. I want that kind of stability where the will of God is the thing that drives us, but the protection of God from that despair, from not knowing, okay, from the uncertainty. We're talking about the ability to have stability, okay, in your life. God's word brings that. God's will brings that, okay, to your life. And it's something that the world does not have. He was just talking to me about this the other night, and it just came to my mind. I pulled it out of my pocket and used it. Um, you know, I mean, it's true, though. Okay, it's true. Mom and dad stay together. Uh, there's a home. Uh, he, you know, they never had to worry about divorce. You know, there was a couple of frying pan moments, uh, probably. No, uh, wasn't any of those, but, um, you know, I mean, like I said, not perfect, but it was, it was a sta stable thing. It's, it's not because of me. It's, it's not because of Amy necessarily, although I give her the best part of the credit for that. But I will say this, it's because of God, okay? All glory goes to him. It's because of God's word and the implementation of God's word. It, it, it comes from knowing God's character, and you can have that same stability in your life. You don't have to live in despair. I find so many times that Christians live in this, uh, this sphere of, I didn't say fear, this sphere of despair. Okay, a sphere of despair. They don't know how to get out of that. Folks, that is not hope. Hope that we have here where we can run to God that we can run to him knowing some things here concerning God. It gives us that sense of stability. It gives us, uh, this hope gives us a refuge, protection from everything else that goes on around us. And I want you to see why, first of all, the protection of God does that and this hope that we have for this refuge. It talks about confidence here. God's protection gives us confidence. The Bible says in this verse that God cannot lie. Okay. By two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. That word impossible is actually a word that has, um, it's, it's made up of what we call the alpha privative, okay, which means you just put an A on the front of it, makes it negative, all right, and dunitas, which is the strength, okay, it literally means to be made weak, to be unable, okay, impossible. It's the, ab it's, the, it's the opposite of strength. It is an utter weakness to accomplish anything. And in use here, it means that he is unable to lie. It is physically impossible, spiritually impossible for God to lie. We can have confidence in God's nature. It is not in his nature at all to lie. He provides us a refuge. That hope that is the opposite of despair, okay? The refuge. We can have utter confidence in God's hope that he offers because of the confidence that we have in him, okay? God can't lie. Has God ever lied? No, God has never lied, okay? And God never will lie. Nothing else in the world can bring that kind of confidence. Nothing else in the world. No one else has that kind of character. I don't care. I mean, we've all been lied to before, okay? And I've been snookered a few times, let me tell you right now. Snookered is a theological word, okay? I have. I have been so naive as to believe the lies of certain people, and I'm like, there's no way that this can be true. And yeah, there was no way that could be true. But I, I was pulled into it, okay? I was pulled into a hook, line, and sinker. Um, I, I'm ashamed of some of the things I've believed about people, okay? Um, and uh, it's just, you know, I, I want to believe, though, okay? I want to believe people. But man, uh, people who really don't even have a reason to lie will lie, okay? Kids will lie to you, okay? Um, uh, you know, I've been with the police, with the sheriff's office. The sheriff's office is not police. I'll get into that later. Um, they're the sheriff. Um, but they're different. Um, when you pull somebody over, you know, 
and they find something. I've, I've been there when, literally, they found a bag, a, a brown bag, looks like a lunch bag, okay, a brown paper sack full of cash and drugs in the car, okay. And they pull out the bag, they look at it, they look in there, and they're like, where'd you get all this money? He goes, that's money's not mine, okay. I was literally there when this happened. Money's not mine. This money right here is not yours. No. What about these drugs? Those, those are mine. I don't know where, I've never seen those before in my life. They're lying outright. And so they'll set the bag down, okay, and if the drug dog can hit on that money with drugs on, like there's been drugs on it, and the drug dog indicates that there's drugs on, associated with that money, they can seize that money. They say, that's not yours? No, nope, that's not mine. Sign this paper, it's not yours. Now it's theirs. Okay, not the deputies necessarily, okay. No, we don't do that. But, you know, it, it goes through a process, okay. But they will say, no, thousands of dollars, not mine. Drugs caught red-handed, not mine. Okay. Let's lie bold-faced to you. Okay. And they expect you to believe that. Okay. I hate being lied to. I really hate being lied to. Um, that is one of the things that is, is, just, not, uh, is just not kosher. Um, you hate being lied to. Okay. We've all lied, though. We've all lied. Okay. God can't lie. Okay. God can't lie. We need to have God's character in this. That's not what I'm preaching on, okay? But if God doesn't lie, hey, we shouldn't be lying either. Shouldn't lie to your spouse, kids. You shouldn't lie to your mom and dads. Shouldn't lie at work. Shouldn't lie at school. Hey, don't lie. But here, the Bible says that God's character, okay, gives us this confidence that God's word is true, that we don't have to live in despair. We can run to him for protection, for our refuge, okay? I hope you do. But I see also that the protection of God not only gives us confidence, but it gives us consolation, okay? God's protection gives us consolation. An immense amount of encouragement. That's what it says here in verse 18, that by two immutable things, two unchangeable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong, listen, consolation. That word literally means encouragement, okay? To come alongside somebody and to help them. Coming alongside helping them bear the load, helping them bear their burden. Um, being an encouragement to somebody means that you partner with them. Right? God does that for the Christian. And in that we have hope, the consolation of God. Have you ever felt like you had no place to anchor your life? You had no place to anchor it? You shouldn't feel like that as a Christian. Okay. These anchors that are, are um, on the deep Deep Sea Navy, the Blue Water Navy, they call them, okay? Um, these anchors are humongous, okay? They're gigantic, and they have a lot of chain on them, okay? Uh, they go very deep, all right? We understand that. And they, they need to have these anchors that can grip something very solid so that these, in the storms, they, they aren't tossed to and fro. Okay. Sometimes you, maybe you guys have been out on a lake or something like that, and you've been fishing, and uh, you know that, you know, um, you probably need an anchor. And they make all kinds of little fishing anchors, I know, little bell-shaped ones, you know, and little actual anchor-type things that claw at the um, bottom of the lake or the pond that you're in or th something like that, okay? So that you can stay in one place, so that you don't move, all right? Um, these things are, are commonplace. We understand what an anchor does, all right? But here we have an anchor, we have a refuge, we have a protection in God that is something that the rest of the world does not have. And because, because sometimes we just won't let that anchor down, okay? We are tossed to and fro. Why wouldn't you let the anchor down? Why wouldn't you uh, trust in that anchor? Okay. You need to rest in God's protection and his refuge in your life. You may have a confidence problem in people. I get it. You don't trust anybody, all right? The older you get, I think the less confidence we have in people. But the older we get in the Lord, we should have more confidence in God, more. As we see how God has protected us all the way through our life. Physical protection, yes, okay? Uh, he's protected us from sin. He's protected us from failures. He's been there when we have fallen and picked us up. 
He's protected us from the despair and from the things when we look around us. You think about Peter, okay, when, when Jesus came walking on the water. They were being tossed to and fro, right? Uh, they were bobbing like a cork out there. And here comes Jesus, and every lightning flash would reveal a personage out there on the middle of the lake there, the Sea of Galilee. And they were so afraid, the Bible says. They were freaking out of their minds, okay? They were so afraid. And here comes Jesus. He says, be not afraid. It is I. Okay? It is I. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, what do you say? Bid me come unto thee on the water. Bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, come. Peter gets out of the boat and he begins to walk toward Jesus. He walks on the water. The Bible says he looks around, he sees the wind boisterous and the storm and the raging sea and everything going on around him, and he begins to sink, and he calls out and says, Lord, help me. You might be in that position right now where you're out there in the sea and you know that Jesus can bid you come on the water. And you begin to walk, the faith is there, the hope, okay, the confident expectation is what we said that word means this morning. Hope in the Bible means confident expectation. We begin to sink, and Jesus reaches forth his hand, and he picks up Peter, and he brings him to the boat, and he says, Wherefore didst thou doubt, O ye of little faith? Why did you doubt? Okay. Sometimes we have to learn that lesson the hard way, I know. Okay. You might get some seawater in your mouth. Okay. You might get the taste of the, wheat, the wind and the waves a little bit. Okay. But the Lord's not going to let you sink. His promises are sure. His hope is is a confident expectation. God is there with real hope for real life. I don't know how other people get by in life without it. You can run to him for refuge. There's the protection of God giving us confidence and giving us consolation as he encourages us every single day. Now, finally, I want you to notice in verses 19 and 20 the presence of God. Here's the last time we see the word hope used in this passage of Scripture. The Bible says in verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you were a, a young Christian, or maybe you hadn't studied the book of Hebrews or something like that, these last two verses might be a little bit confusing for you, and you say, what are they talking about? I'm glad you asked the question. All right, it's really talking about the presence of God here and how our hope is founded upon the presence of God because this hope that is such a stabilizing force, it's such a stabilizing influence for the Christian is this anchor that the writer of Hebrews says that is keeping us from, and our lives from drifting. Okay? And, you know, that's the whole reason he started writing in Hebrews chapter 6 here was because these other people drifted away from the truth that is in Christ. They drifted. He's saying, look, folks, and he uses these, these words these three times for hope here, of this assurance, this confident expectation that he's been talking about to say, look, you don't have to be like those people in verses 1 through 8, okay? I want you, he says, we expect better things of you, beginning in verse 9, okay? We, we, we are persuaded better things of you. He says, God knows how you've loved the saints. God knows how you've ministered. God knows your labor for him, how you've served him. Don't give up now. And he says, the last thing that I want you to understand is that we can have the presence of God, and that is the basis for our hope here right now. It's a stabilizing force. It keeps us from drifting. So the writer of Hebrews says that the hope that entereth into that within the veil entereth into that within the veil. This is where it gets a little bit confusing, maybe, if you haven't studied Hebrews before. What's that speaking of? It's speaking of the Holy of Holies, the most holy place in the tabernacle at first and then in the temple. You had the, you had the outer court where people were, and then you had the holy place, and then you had the Holy of Holies. Okay? Remember that when Jesus Christ died, uh, that veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was rent in two. And it was a very thick curtain. No light could pass between that curtain uh, in the holy of holies into the holy place. 
And then the priest would minister in the holy place and do things in there, uh, as was specified in the book of Leviticus and other places there. But only one time a year would the high priest go into the holy of holies to offer atonement for the people. And that was limited to the high priest and him alone. And if he did not do everything exactly correct, he was dead. He was killed. Okay. He had to do everything that was prescribed by the law. When he went in there, it was an austere thing because he was coming to the very presence of God. The Shekinah glory dwelt in the Holy of Holies during the good days of Israel's history. Okay. The Shekinah glory dwelt above the, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. That's where God's presence was. And the writer of Hebrews, he alludes to the sacrificial system of worship that the Jews had uh, many, many times here in the book of Hebrews. But this is one of those times where he talks about entereth into that within the veil. Okay, that was where God's presence was. Okay, that was where atonement was made. One time a year on the day of atonement in order to minister on behalf of the people. The people were not allowed to enter there. In fact, all the priests weren't allowed to enter into there. But the Bible says that now, through Jesus Christ's work on the cross, hope enters there. Okay? Hope enters there. And the presence of God can be known by every single Christian. Because the Christian hope is not exhausted by what it sees of earthly possibilities. I mentioned that this morning. That when you talked about Abraham, there were earthly impossibilities. There was things that were keeping Sarah and Abraham from having children. This, in this case, it was age. All right? Age. Does age need to keep a Christian back from praying? No. Does age need to keep a Christian back from serving God? No. Okay. Can God do things even though we get up in age? Yeah, he can. Okay. Is God limited by age? No, he's not. Our bodies are limited by age many times. I understand we can't do the same things we used to do. My, I think I can do the same things I used to do, but it's just a figment of my imagination. Let me tell you right now, okay? <clears throat> I just turned 53, <laughs> and uh, I'm married to a grandma, okay? Um, she's not in here. I think she's in the nursery, so I'm, a, I'm all right. But is God limited by anything, including age? No. God is not limited by, by, by anything. This world uh, says will limit you. God's not limited by those things. Okay? Earthly possibilities or impossibilities. We as Christians can enter into God's presence through Jesus Christ. And I preached pretty, pretty hard this morning on salvation for a reason. Okay? Um, I want uh, people to understand, certain people that I know are watching, I want them to understand what salvation is all about, okay? But if you're a Christian here today, and you have asked Jesus into your heart, okay? The Bible says with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. The Bible says that he will come into you, and sup with you, and he, you with him, okay? The Holy Spirit of God comes in and dwells within each Christian at the moment of salvation, at that moment, we receive the Spirit of God. We are sealed under the day of redemption. Okay? We're sealed. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. But we as Christians have the presence of God through Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can enter into heaven, and that's the only way we can enter into the veil, so to speak, and have this fellowship with God. The Bible says that we come boldly okay, to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. We don't have to go through a man. Nobody has to go through a priest. Nobody has to go through a high priest in order to have their sins forgiven, in order to have, um, in, in order to have their, uh, you know, uh, them to be told that they have to do such and such a thing in order to do that, that they uh, have, are going through some religious ritual in order to have their sins, you know, exonerated, okay? Nobody has to do that. We come right into the throne of grace, okay? We're allowed into God's presence, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can come into God's presence. And so we as Christians, we enter into God's presence through Christ, and this hope reaches into the very presence of God. There's two aspects of God's presence here. First of all, the Bible says that the presence of God provides security. 
I say this, and I understand I talked about protection already, but this is the word that is being used here in verse 19, where it says, sure and steadfast. That word sure is the word for secure, for secure. Okay. Undisturbed by outward influences is what it means. Okay. So the presence of God ensures that no matter what may come, our lives are firmly anchored in the hope that it'll be a steadying anchor in all that we do. Steadfast and sure, the Bible says. All right. Security in that word sure. You know, um, there's so much, um, there's billions of dollars spent every year on security, security in our lives. From locks on your doors to cameras and things. How many of you have cameras on your houses? You're willing to say you got cameras, okay? I put cameras up on my house, okay? People know when I'm here at church. I had my back door kicked in um, when I was at a Wednesday night service a few years ago. I think Ember, my dog, scared him off, and her, do her bark will scare you off. Uh, but her lick is, is going to come soon after that as far as, be, you know, she'll be your friend, you know. She'll bark for a while, but then she'll be your friend right quick, okay? So if they get past the barking, they'll be right in. But, um, but I have security cameras on my home, okay? Um, and uh, I think it's a, it's a good idea. More and more people are getting security cameras on their home. Security cameras, though, you have to watch them 24-7 if you're really going to do anything right, okay? Um, mine, mine aren't set right now. I probably shouldn't say that on live stream. Uh, but, you know, it's motion activated, okay? I can, it tells me uh, when, um, when, some, when something uh, comes into my, into my camera's um, view, okay? So uh, we're up picking up uh, the grandkids, Nate and Lorena from Michigan. When I'm gone, I'm going to set the cameras, all right? So they are watching, all right? See if Neil Habegger comes over and does something in my house or something, you know. Where's Neil? Oh, they might have left. Um, but um, so, no, I, I have good neighbors. And I know that as well, so I'm pretty comfortable with that. But five times on Friday night into Saturday morning, I was awakened by my cameras. You know, I've got this siren that's along, uh, that goes off you know, wakes you up out of a dead sleep. But let me tell you right now, raccoons, a family of raccoons, they're looking for the trash can. Okay, it's out at the road, guys. Okay, go get it at the road. Okay. Um, I'm like, really? Like three times it was raccoons. One time it was a cat looking for my cat, Cheeto. Okay. Um, and Cheeto's not, not outside cat, so I don't know why that other cat comes around. All right. One time it was a wasp in the morning hours, it was a wasp right on one of the cameras, okay? That, that's freaky, okay? Um, you know, seeing this monster wasp uh, right there. I didn't get a wink of sleep, okay? These cameras are going off all night, all because I want to be sure to make sure that my back door's not getting kicked in while I'm gone, okay? Security, okay? Put locks on your doors. Those can be easily bypassed. Uh, you put a chain on something, that can be easily cut. People spend all this money on security to keep their stuff secure. It's not secure. There's always a way around it. Always a way around it. Okay. But not with the Lord. Okay. The, he uses this word on purpose here. Both sure, that's the security that we see here, undisturbed by outward influences. Do outward influences disturb you? We should have this constant hope in our lives, this confident expectation that God is working everything out for the Christian. Romans 8, 28, right? And we know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So it doesn't matter what happens in your life, Christian. It doesn't matter uh, what you hear at work. It doesn't matter what you hear in the news. It doesn't matter what you hear at the doctor's office. It doesn't matter. He's working all things out for your good. And I have a confident expectation in that. Now, I might not like it at first. But if you've ever been through one of those situations, you know that at the end of it, you can look back and see that God was working that out for good. My good. My good. Every single time. Every single time. So he uses this word security. And he also uses this word steadfast, which is stability here, which is what I'm preaching about. The ability to have stability. That's what this word steadfast means. We have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Steadfast, meaning stable or firm, like a base, a foundation. It's our ability to 
pardon me, to enjoy the presence of God. It brings stability into our life. Are you content with the presence of God in your life every single day? The presence of God, which comes from, yes, reading his word. The presence of God, which comes, yes, from having a vibrant prayer life. You should be praying. You should be asking God for things. But the presence of God, uh, like in Thessalonians, where it says, pray without ceasing. I, I feel like that all the time, that I'm never apart from God. Do you, do you have that sense of his presence? That you're never far from the Lord, that you know that he's always walking with you every single day? It's a relationship that you carry on with him. He's never, he's never gone from you. Okay? You can rely upon him. You let him talk to you. You talk to him in prayer. This is what we're talking about, this steadfast anchor of the soul. Christ died for our sins. He entered into that veil. He made it where I, uh, wherefore we can... Um, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, He is a high priest that God has made here. He is of the line of Judah. He's not of the priestly uh, line of Levi, Okay, of the Le Levites. Okay. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. God has had priests outside of the order of the Levites. Okay. And this is Christ. Okay. He gives us security. He gives us stability because of his presence. Because of his presence. Now, I've spent two messages on this. Is this because I just want to preach an esoteric message on the hope that we have in God? No. It's a very practical thing, folks. Very practical. Does this touch your life or your living today? It should. Okay. Christians should not live in despair. Christians don't have to uh, give up which is part of what this chapter is about, just people giving up on God. And I don't think Christians should succumb to the hopeless world around them. Christians shouldn't succumb to their own fallibilities. Okay. Without hope, without that anchor, our Christian lives are going to be tossed every time a storm comes. Every time. And when we are tossed, this is the, this is the issue that I'm really preaching about here tonight, all day. When we are in an uproar, when we, are, uh, when we are looking at the waves around us and the boisterous uh, winds around us, and we're looking at the storms that are swirling and whirling all around us, are you thinking about somebody else who needs to hear the gospel? No. Okay, you're thinking about you. You're thinking about your own stability. You're thinking about how can I find this stability again? You're not thinking about how am I going to serve the Lord. You may not even be thinking about reading God's word which is exactly where we need to be turning to in the storms of life. You may not want to pray because, once again, you know, people say, ah, oh, God answers their, their prayers, you know, but not mine. No, God says, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God says he will hear and answer your prayers. That's the promises I preached about this morning. Okay. And so if your life is in turmoil, then the devil is having his way with you. All he has to do is keep your life in turmoil. He wants my life in turmoil. He doesn't want me focusing. He doesn't want me concentrating. He doesn't want me studying. He doesn't want me evangelizing. He doesn't want me witnessing. He doesn't want me visiting people. He doesn't want me to do anything. He wants my life in turmoil. He wants your life in turmoil. But we don't have to have it that way. We have this hope. Because of the promises of God, the protection of God, the presence of God in our life. There'll be no growth in spiritual maturity. There won't be anybody using their spiritual gifts. There'll be a lackluster Christianity in our world today who sees no benefit in being a Christian because we seem to be in the same hopeless condition that they are. Why would they want that? That's not what Christianity should be about. We should be able to show that we have the ability to be stable in this world because of the hope that we have in Christ Jesus and what he has done for us. That gives a Christian stability. It truly does. With heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around here tonight, I wonder how a message like this has spoken in your heart today. Maybe, maybe you are experiencing turmoil. Maybe you are experiencing boisterousness of this life and the storms of life. 
Maybe you're experiencing despair. You don't know where to turn. The Bible says that God is our refuge, a very present help in time of trouble. There's all kinds of verses we could have brought to bear in on this. Okay? Time does not permit. But we know God's word, and yet we refuse to believe his promises. We refuse to accept his protection and relish in his presence. And because of that, we are experiencing instability. The Bible says, be careful of the double-minded man. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That is not what we want to be, okay? How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. Are you experiencing this kind of stability because of the hope that we have in God? If you're a Christian here tonight, maybe you'd say, Pastor Ray, would you pray for me? Something from God's word has spoken to my heart. I need to make a decision concerning this. The Holy Spirit is prodding me, bringing conviction and challenge. Thank you for that hand and that hand. Anybody else, Pastor Ray, pray for me. Anybody else tonight? God is working in my heart. I needed that message. So pray for me. Anybody else? We're going to have our time of invitation here. Come, you sinners, poor and needy. And if there's an issue, if there's a problem, if there's something we can help you with, why don't you come? If you want to join the church, membership, or baptism, come, and the deacons will talk to you here tonight. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for the stability that we have in Christ. Lord, may each and every one of us tonight know that stability in our life as we move forward even this week. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. You sing and come. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord today. Um, I never get tired of being in God's house. I never do. I hope you don't. I think uh, just by you being here tonight, you want to be here. No one made you be here. And uh, thank you for being here. Uh, for our online crowd, thank you for joining us as well. I ask that if you are from a different state and you're joining us online, let us know if you're in a different state. Some, uh, I saw one today that was in a different state. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, very interesting to me. And so if you would just say hi to us on the Facebook or communicate with us if you're coming in from a different state, we'd sure like to hear that as well. We only know uh, basic metrics as far as um, what we can see on the backside of, of the uh, technology there. But um, we would be very interested in knowing how we can help you as well anytime. All right. So I hope you have a great week. Pray for one another. Uh, don't forget... Um, to pray for Gail Walenta, who starts radiation tomorrow as well. Um, pray for her. Hope to see you on Super Summer Tuesday as well uh, with Chaplain Matt Barnes. All right. Is there anything else that we need to make mention of? I know that we had Mike and Kara Patrick here this morning. They came in kind of late, and I didn't see them back here. Um, they have their, their little baby Marshall with them. Um, and I will get to them when they come back, Lord willing, next Sunday and introduce Marshall to the church here. All right. Okay. Anything else? All right, well, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Doug Grin said, why don't you close us in prayer, please, and then we'll have our final song. We have an anchor.